I am the contrarian and this is my world. Aging and death both completely killed off. We're saying it's about to happen, but what happens after that and what could be the problems? We believe nothing. But I have two people here who seem to think the contrarian knows nothing. Samit Basu is going to join me and Rahul Ishwar from Kerala. And I'm going to start off with Samit. I'm going to give you one minute. To first, tell me what you think about this entire thought process. If it's a question of personal choice, if you want to sort of, you know, replace my organs with mechanical parts or bioprinted things or clone me or, you know, do any of the things that the quest for immortality might lead us to, um, I'd personally be all for it, right? Because the whole point of, say, being an author is that you try to achieve immortality, but in the process, if you're printed, you also kill trees. Right? So, so the question really is that, of course, every individual would want immortality, love, power, money, because that's, that's a basic human desire, right? But especially living in the world that we do and the country that we do, we'd have to consider that given the, the, the sort of differences, the disparities between, say, even basic medicine for the privileged and the underprivileged, um, whose immortality are we concerned about? Would you be happy if other people were also immortal? Rahul Ishwar joins me from Kerala. Your one minute starts now. The search for immortality has always been there. 5,000 years back, there was a king called a Yayati in India. Or in the 4,000 years back, Mesopotamia, there was Gilgamesh. They were all in search of immortality. Immortality as an idea has existed in the mind of philosophers, science fiction writers, others from time immemorial. But the question is, what really survives? We can see this point from three aspects. One is scientific, second is spiritual, third is social. Uh, from a scientific viewpoint, if you look at uh, D. Gray's research, he's, he had this SEN, a structure for engineered negligible citizens, which works on this. He claims that biological immortality is possible. He has done research with jellyfish, many other forms, hydra. So that's one scientific aspect. But one social aspect is who really becomes immortal? If you are going for immortality, I know there won't we be creating one class of citizen like the Hollywood movies, where are Greek gods who are immortal and the other less mortals like us who will live and die. So anything meaningful in this life has a beginning and an end. What is the preference for things like aging and death? The whole meaning comes from there is a beginning and an end. That's a nature's process. Everything that has a start will also have an end. Of course, health considerations are definitely for people. We should take care of people's health. We should um, uh, let them live a happy, healthy and meaningful life. If there is no death, something like what he's also said, if there is no going away, and there is stagnation. Why is it stagnation? Only because we've thought of it that way. Isn't science fiction in the future based on the past? Isn't the Absolutely. thought of everything we think in the future based on everything we've experienced in Absolutely. the past? So SF is based on observation of the past and projection into the future. This can be escaped under the condition that humanity also evolves to a point, you know, beyond medicine, science and so on. Um, which again is something that you really can't predict. Uh, one of the big arguments that religious and philosophy, uh, especially people always give me is, it's not the amount of years that you live on earth, it's how you spend those years. So, it's not how many years you live, but how you live in those years that really matter. See, I think uh, religion and philosophy have always been very uh, good at justifying other people's deaths. Does <laughs> someone's life have value? It has value to him. When we speak about Science, technology and medical breakthroughs taking you to a better lifespan or immortality eventually, it eradicates Alzheimer's and all others as a pathway, as a barrier on the way. All diseases need to be eradicated before you can get immortality. That's obvious. Without that, we're not going to be achieving it. If I could grant you today 200 years of life exactly the way you're looking and feeling right now, would you take it? Yeah, obviously, there is. You know, every human being wants to live forever. Or, you know, we have some kind of wish for immortality in some form or the other. There is no denying that aspect. Let's get down to, away from the religious and philosophy part of it, a very important point that was made, and that is, who will live forever, right? Is it going to be only a particular sect of people who can mm -hmm. afford it? Absolutely. Is it going to be only for the rich? And what does it do to everything else, natural resources, barriers, 
politics, age and everything else that the world knows today. Uh, you can't uh, consume natural resources at the same rate that you are now, which is, which is in one way or another behind every war that you have, behind every kind of act of genocide that you have. So we're seeing increasing polarities in incomes and, and access to resources of people. So yes, uh, it's a very interesting analogy that you used, um, the, the idea that something that starts off as exclusive eventually spreads to the mass. Here though, the mass would reduce until everyone who was left had it. Should we stop progress only because a few will be able to afford it right in the beginning? I agree with the point when you say that, that progress may be exclusive for a privileged class in the beginning, but it will trickle down. That's the understanding and that's our experience of all the people. But having said that, we should be careful and conscious enough not to create or not to perpetuate two class of citizens. Imagine a situation where there are one elite class who will live for a thousand years and the other people who will live for 50 years and this thousand year class will always have all the riches, all the money, all the luxuries in the world. A zero death rate is supposed to be the scariest prospect for natural resources, uh, geographical boundaries, hmm. politics, and especially economy and finance. Carrying capacity. Exactly. So the earth doesn't have the carrying capacity for zero death rate and birth rate to continue, right? Now let me understand, the biggest scare of course is economy and finance. Retirement age, will there be something called a retirement age? Why should there be? Exactly. But then how do you sustain the economy of an always working world? You don't have kids, which is where the stagnation comes from. Okay, so then you're saying zero death rate with zero birth rate. Now that would be the scariest thing on earth. So, so now tell me your solution is zero death rate. It's not my solution. Okay, <laughs> I'd like to understand the all the scares of zero death rate. What do you think are the biggest scares there? Um, unsustainability. And see, it's also that every other field has to progress along equally dramatic rates for the earth to sustain itself. You have to either colonize other planets or you have to discover new sources of food and but energy. But do we also realize that when we say this, I know you're a science fiction author, so this is the easy one, colonize. Isn't it more difficult to go and live on the moon or Mars than all the areas on earth that we still haven't really used? This is a world where literally anything is possible in that case, right? Because death is the basic fact of our existence. You've removed that. It could, anything is possible, which okay. is which is where science fiction people have so much fun. Playing God, uh, something scary? I believe the whole history of mankind is not struggle against nature, but struggle for progress along with the nature. Nature, there are some natural laws we should understand. Of course, we can modify, we can uh, you know, recharge its course. But having said that, we are a part of nature. This is a classic difference between a human-centric view of the West and a nature-centric view of the East or Indian subcontinent, where we believe we are a part of whole. We are not the whole. We are not the masters. We are one of the part of whole. And of course, being the most so-called intelligent of species, most conscious of the species, we should develop, we should guide nature in a good way. But we are not in confrontation with nature. Rather, we are in conciliation with nature, which works for the betterment of us, animals, and the nature in totality. Why should I accept the rules of nature when I can't twist and break them now? The first time ever that we, this world may be seeing science and technology merge and philosophy may not be going there for the same ride. See, science and technology's development is very acceptable and I can be proud to say, you look at India's history, we have never persecuted a scientist. Of course, we had many other problems, but we have never been against science. And what is science? Science is the progressive inventions of nature's law and how to overcome it. So our whole search was never anti-science like the West, where West used to lock up scientists for saying scientific truths. Our approach has always been, our scientific approach has always been in supportive of science. But having said that, there are some things we should accept as a part. And at the end of the day, we have a, you know, at the base of it, we have a very spiritual case. So we have a very deep philosophical, spiritual angle to it which is not contradictory to science, but which is complementary to science. Thank you, Rahul, out there in <laughs> Kerala. Thank you, Samit, for being out here right now. Pleasure. As the contrarian, I get the advantage of the last Good. word, and that is, I don't think there is anybody out here, whether they were for or against the topic, whether it was the two panelists, me or the audience, that doesn't like the idea that aging and lifespans can be changed forever. But everybody has a viewpoint that all other things must be considered when you're going on that amazing, amazing quest for the Holy Grail. And with that, I think I'll leave it for you to decide. Would you like to live forever? How those years will be are the most important things to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you.